Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to Friday at 5. We're glad to have you here. I'm Karen Taylor, co-author of The Color Vowel Chart and director of English Language Training Solutions. Uh, we get together every Friday uh, to make connections between what we do as ESL or EFL teachers and the technologies that we are now pretty much compelled to use on one level or another. Um, this is a place where we answer real questions. Uh, we, you know, we're basically here to support one another and stretch one another with our discoveries each week. Um, this week's topic is officially titled Google Classroom. Uh, we started sort of polling people and asking around and figured out that I think from a session we had last night, I, I watched Robin, uh, when I said Google Classroom, she said <laughs> with her, I don't know what that is. And so I thought, let's start from the basics and we'll, we'll reframe this as an exploration today of platforms and tools that we use for online teaching so that we can provide some schema for what, what Google Classroom is and what similar platforms are because if you don't use one, you might want to. And if you need to use something else, this can provide you with some useful schema for succeeding elsewhere, okay? Um, so we'll start off, and I, I wanna thank Jennifer Campion's in the room. She's uh, running the, you know, steering the ship, and she will be um, in the chat answering questions and providing links too. But she's also provided me with a very handy um, sort of way to frame today. And um, so let me share that with you. Okay. All right. So just oh, wow. a little bit. I know. She did a beautiful job today. <laughs> so first, I'd like to just start with a bit of polling. And I'll, I'll keep toddling back and forth between showing you, you know, a slideshow and, and just talking with you. Um, but the questions are, um, how many of you are ESL versus EFL? And I think I can do that just by looking at the room for a minute. Just raise your hand, one finger, if you are ESL in an English-speaking context here in the U.S. Whose English is a foreign language, teaching folks who are surrounded by a different language, a two. And Liz is going to hold up a three because she's an iconoclast. So what does three mean? <laughs> All of them. Both. Exactly. <laughs> One plus two yeah, equals three. three. Countries and some students are okay. here. Great. Hey, welcome, Megan. Good to see you, Susan and others. Um, Joan, I kind of saw you holding up a one. Is that right? We can't hear you. I'm sorry. My mic is not going to sound good. I need to fix my mic. So let me do that for you first. But I don't, I'm not sure exactly what you're, I'm not sure. Yeah, I think you're teaching. So good. I think you're teaching because I, I know you a little bit. So I'll tell you, I think you're a three. Um, I think sometimes <laughs> you teach people English as a second language would be when they are surrounded by other English speakers in society and they have, you know, life skills needs and workplace needs. EFL would be something like now. Now is teaching in Japan, right? And so is Alejandra, right? You're in an EFL situation. So that's our reference to ESL, EFL, uh, is just making that distinction. Great. Another quick poll. Uh, raise your one finger if you are in K through 12. Who's in K through 12? There we go. Nice. And of those, I'm particularly, uh, wag it if you're using Google Classroom. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Okay, so that looks like no, but it's a yes. All right, good. So we have a couple people who are compelled to use it um, for reasons that, that come with teaching K through 12. Um, raise two fingers if you are in um, teaching in a higher ed situation. Higher ed, this would be a university, it would be college, community college. Megan, I think you might be a two. Okay. And is anybody uh, teaching adult ed, adult literacy? That would be a three. Okay. You know, we have a nice range there. And by the way, if, if you're, you know, we're, I'm never going to assume that nobody's, um, I'm never going to assume that nobody's new to Zoom. So <laughs> you might want to look at this in the gallery view, like the Brady Bunch view where you can see everybody because all these polls are so much more satisfying when you can watch everybody's fingers. Yeah, that's fun. All right. Good stuff. Um, and then finally, I'd like to know, uh, is anybody heading back to school face-to-face -face imminently? 
dodged that bullet. Okay, <laughs> so Regina. so it's safe to say we're all we're all heading into online situations and no, Regina's gonna be face to face. Oh, are you? There you are, Regina. You want to tell us about that? Is it all face to face hybrid? Just me face to face, um, but we do have to offer virtual also. Oh, you get to do both. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, my, Congratulations. In, in my district, the ESL kids are considered high risk. And so as of the like 22nd of September, they are supposed to be back in the building. But I just got signed off by my doctor to not be in the building. So my colleague will be the one do, doing face to face and I will pick up her high school kids um, working with them online. Okay. You know, I think what in all seriousness, you know, we can talk about, you know, whoo, but we're all in these situations where things can change um, in a moment and mm -hmm. our colleagues too. And so your colleagues also may be coming to you for support if you are teaching online and then they suddenly have to. Um, and there's so much tied up in that emotionally and just thinking about safety, but let's, let's focus on that, that you might be here to learn something, but you're gonna turn right around and possibly share and teach it to another teacher. Uh, so feel free to ask those kinds of questions and, and we'll all seek to answer those, okay? Um, okay, and I'm basically still working with a couple of questions and you don't get to see them because I want to see you. So here I'm going to ask, uh, teaching on Zoom. Raise a hand if you're teaching on Zoom for, okay, are you using some other video platform? Now, I don't know, do something different some other video platform. Susan, can you tell us what you're using? Uh, we're using Google Meet. Okay. Just because we're Google School. Right, Google School. Joan? Uh, with my Chinese students, we use Zoomu, which is exactly like Zoom. It's Chinese version. It's the Chinese copy of Zoom. All right. And uh, we decided to go with WebEx this year with at the community college so okay that's the same those are the folks that do go to meetings and another set of tools okay robin uh i've been using zoom at au blackboard ultra at udc we started using zoom at wlc and now au is transitioning to canvas and does canvas have its own built-in i have feature? no clue okay anyone want to <laughs> but i'm transitioning to it it okay. must it must do the same Otherwise, why would they be transitioning to it from Blackboard if it doesn't do the same? Well, I don't know. Right. Okay. Good. Anybody know, has anybody here used Canvas? Exactly. That's why I'm looking around the room. Who's a Canvas okay. user? Jennifer. I've used Canvas, but I don't, I'm not aware of a, a, a video plugin for it. Um, <laughs> uh, I think some of the AU teachers are using Zoom. Uh, yeah, okay. so far. Yeah, well, we'll see. So... Yeah. Quick, quick Google search says Canvas, you can embed video, but it doesn't mention anything about live video. Okay, so if your head is spinning with, you know, what's Canvas? I don't even know what that is. I don't know what the other thing is. Um, do know that we had a wonderful session by Rebecca Wilner. I just texted this to you in the chat. Uh, so go ahead and find the chat if you have it already. Um, that was a session we gave, I don't know, Rebecca gave probably eight weeks ago. So if you want to kind of get um, the lay of the land on what tools are like what other tools, I love having that kind of information. Um, you can go check out that recording from a past session. And that's by way of saying that's not this session. <laughs> I, I won't pretend to be that knowledgeable um, or that this is the focus today. I should be a little clearer. Um, but you know, so Canvas, is it like Blackboard? Yes. Um, is Zoom like Blackboard? No. It's worth knowing, you know, what's a, a bigger tool versus a narrower tool. And Rebecca's session was great for that. So take a look at that. Okay. Um, well, let me see here. I think I received, I think we have what we want for that. So let me present some of the questions we'll explore today. And then we'll be able to, um, I'll be definitely including a bit on Google Classroom with you. Um, so some, some things that we'll talk about today to dig deeper. Um, do you have experience with the technology tools you need to use? Or are you being, you know, in, a sense, in essence, launched into something brand new? Uh, <laughs> Robin, we can see from your, your nonverbal language that you feel it, you're in a free fall of uh, tech learning, okay? Uh, what concerns do you have about using those tools? Um, merely surviving them, <laughs> doing it well. 
Uh, third question, what successes have you had with those tools? And you know, this is where I love, I love that question because we can feel like we're in free fall and yet suddenly we have a solution to someone else's problem. So, you know, Robin, who just expressed free fall, uh, was just a few weeks ago showing us how to use Zoom breakout rooms because well, she it, it's true. I got shoved into Zoom uh, uh, kicking and screaming, but I found it pretty uh, intuitive. But on the other hand, just this, uh, I guess yesterday, <laughs> yesterday morning, I was trying to teach uh, two other people how to use, no, three other people how to use Zoom, and they just had no, I was just, I felt like such a bad teacher that they couldn't figure out. Hey, you just unmuted yourself, I think. Let's see. <laughs> I keep unmuting and you keep unmuting me. So we're, we're going back and forth. Yeah, no, they, they couldn't, I, I couldn't describe to them uh, how to find the things that they needed to click on because a picture is worth a thousand words, you know? I mean, the, the only solution would be, okay, go to the Zoom uh, help page and, and look at it. Yeah. And then, yeah. you know, but so, I couldn't so teaching, walk them through it. But on the other hand, you really do have answers. And that's, that's what I want to get to is, yeah. is that this is not a linear um, uh, format of learning when it comes to teachers in tech. It really is taking what you do know how to do and realize someone else is going to benefit from that. It is a stone soup. You know, you have something to contribute whether you know it or not. Um, so with that said, um, let's take a moment and just, I want to get a gauge of sort of top of mind, who's worried? <laughs> who's concerned about tools that you're actually using? If, if you could let us know, you know, I'm Karen, I have to use Google Classroom and I'm concerned because it's brand new to me. Do we have anybody here who's, you know, with a, a real pain point on that, that would like to express that so that I know we want to, to address it today? Anyone with a burning, yeah, Skip? I can't hear you though. Yeah. I, I yeah, I, I, I don't, I have my NCPS uh, classroom, Montgomery County Public Schools, and uh, uh, I've been using Google Classroom because the students know how to use it. So it's kind of the opposite. Going into my MCPS, my students don't know how to use it. They're beginning level ESOL 1. I'm worried about that. <laughs> yeah, that's my problem. We're trying to figure out not just what can the teachers do, but what can, how, how can we teach our students how to do it if we're not there? So yeah. Skip, they're making you stop using Google Classroom and use a different platform? Uh, they keep pushing that because they, my MCPS, I think they're kind of uh, contractually obligated. I don't know the word. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. it, it's uh, kind of, uh, we, we just keep using Google Classroom because <laughs> it's going to be easier for our students. Our students are going to be lost and they have been lost with my MCPS with, <laughs> with their platform. Exactly. <laughs> so. so that's, that's another, um, let's say a, another overlay to the question of tech is what organization do you work with and how much do they control or seek to control you and the students and what you use. And it goes hand in hand with often with politics when a school system has invested in some platform mm -hmm. and they really want to show that the investment was worthwhile, but it's not a practical platform. And, and so sometimes you have to be subversive and decide this is what's going to serve me and my students best. Uh, we had a session fairly recently about communication tools like WhatsApp versus any other kind of tool. And we found that for ESOL students and their parents, um, and I can speak to, you know, my husband is an ESOL paraprofessional bilingual. And so he just found you have to read, you have to find parents in the tools that they use. And you're not going to find them through email. Uh, you will be able to communicate through this other app that I won't mention right now. But you know, you find the tools that, that people have or have access to. Yeah, I, I had a parent this spring who just, who texted me and who emailed me and begged me, can we please just FaceTime? Exactly. You know, and I had just, a, I had a doctor's appointment for my kids this morning and all the tech and the big portal of the big, you know, insurance group just wasn't working. And they're like, can we just FaceTime you? I was like, absolutely. So, you know, we will find those moments and we have to make those judicious decisions to, it's what I call being subversive, um, to go around and find a better solution for the moment. 
Um, so there's, I'm hearing some of that in Skip's story a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I texted a student who who was uh, um, with personal texting. You're never supposed to do, and I did that because I could never get a hold of him. I couldn't find him. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I called right. up. I called up through the language line, and I called and called, and we, but I'm. I finally got him on texting. <laughs> so. so as Robin said, you know, we are uh, worried uh, for our students. Um, exactly. How do yeah. we yeah. train them to access this? And is it even possible? Yeah. And okay. especially since they're non-literate and right. not computer literate either. And yeah. yeah, so Robin really has a challenging case there. Any other? And they're the adults, so there's no adult in the room to help them through it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's, right. that's what teenagers are for. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and um, then swap, right? <laughs> yes, some of them do have kids. For... It might be helpful. Yeah, the the my student was like eleven years old, and he would always be in someone else's class. I mean, that's the kind of you know that's the situation. <laughs> it's like, no, come back to my class. <laughs> right. Can we anything else to add here, Jennifer? Yeah, I was going to say for Skip, maybe we can talk about this as we go on today. But um, since you have this platform that your school district has created and wants you to use, um, but you're, you know, subversively, you're going to use um, Google Classroom, um, maybe sort of one of the sort of uh, a task based learning for your students is on Google Classroom, teaching them how to use the platform yes. that they're going to have to use perhaps with their other teachers so it's sort of a a very real sort of project yes. that and task that they can learn in your class that's a great right. point jennifer yes yeah yeah and using using facetime to teach them how to get on with zoom you know that kind of thing wonderful okay so third thing or are we are, are we good for now yeah, and if you and if you've got Google Meet and you can, you know, do sh screen sharing, you know, I found even having the kids share their screen back to me. I mean, having them say, "I'm stuck here. What do I do?" and then I can see their screen and talk them through what they need to do, um, assuming I know what, what they're doing. That's right. But seeing what they're doing is great. Alejandra, did you you were syndicating an interest there? Yeah. In Mexico. Mexico for spring they tried to have Google Classroom for for the students. Um, they provided um, new new names and or new emails and and gave codes to the teachers and the students. But then for my in my school only one teacher used it. And the rest um, was not comfortable with it. So they used WhatsApp. In my case, English was included in the grade um, or group in the group classes. So I couldn't access the, the teacher, the main teacher or the grade teacher could see the, the English lessons but I, I couldn't, and she tried to, so this was created by the estate, so um, I didn't get a, an special um, email, or the, the email for that, so they, we, we, I tried to be a partner for, the, for a teacher, and I couldn't, mm -hmm. so um, we haven't, I don't know if they have tried, to check if they, the teacher that have the same kind of um, email, yeah, yeah, uh, are able to work together. And this is so, yeah. Um, I just wanted to share. I, I don't know. I'm not thinking about using Google Classroom. I might have to if if they require and they have the access. But one teacher was telling me maybe we could give you access to all of our accounts you know i teach the whole i teach the sixth grade the six grades in elementary so i have 12 groups um two hours per group and but that would be crazy for me to um, to manage to administrate <laughs> so i'm here to, to learn and get ideas but i'm not sure if if i'm going to have to use it 
Okay. So, well, Wonderful. That's good to know. Can I say well, that's one thing I've heard, Alejandra, that's one thing I've heard about Google Classroom um, through the groups I work with, um, that just getting people on, the whole idea of the, spe you have to have a special recognized email with the with Google Classroom and um, you know school districts have had problems with that. Oh, okay. Well, good. So let's take a moment and just say that recognize that Google Classroom is available to the public, and that's a really important distinction. And that's why somebody like Skip is, uh, or say, schools uh, teachers in his school system might jump out of their school cordoned system over to Google uh, Classroom because at least it's a tool I have accessible to me. And it's the same phenomenon of moving out of say a classroom dojo. If, if anybody's K through 12, they might know dojo. It's like an internal communication system for parents and teachers. And they might just go on over to FaceTime because it's accessible, it's there. Um, so I'd like to start just by showing uh, where you would find it if you wanted to create your own Google Classroom from scratch. Is, is that, can I just see a if, if hand of if interest for that if anybody's, some are? Okay, we won't spend a ton of time, but I kind of don't, I don't want to skip into how to use Google Classroom without just like how to get started a little bit. Um, so I've jumped into my, I'm going to broadcast my my personal email because I wanted to kind of show you, you know, this isn't like any special business email or special business account. And I'm protecting my privacy by showing you a bunch of my, um, you know, some things that don't matter. Um, so here is a glimpse of a bunch of my neighborhood <laughs> listserv um, as we jump in here since I record this. If you go up into your Google tools, that little pad, you know, if you're in a Gmail account, you have a Google account and you go to the dial pad or the, the waffle menu as we call it. And if you scroll down, you will find that you have classroom. So that's what classroom looks like. And you can move it around by the way. You can you know, drag it and move it up, okay? So that it's easier to find. So I might, I might put it up here if I'm gonna start using it. Now when I'm up here, I, I'm happy. And now you also know you can reorganize other things, right? Okay, oops, not what I wanted. Okay, so let's go back, yeah, not what I wanted. Let's try that again, go back to classroom. But I finally found where contacts live, that's nice. <laughs> I've been wondering that for months. So, <laughs> all right, and so in here, um, you can see that in this case, I am, um, I happen to be a student in three courses that are courses I run over on the color vowel side. <laughs> so um, this is the student view of courses that I'm in but I could also uh, create a classroom. I could create one right there. Or I could join one, and this is what your students would do. They would join a class, and they could enter a class code. So that's kind of what they're doing on their side, okay? Um, so a couple of views there that, that I don't have any classes in this, in this space here. These are all classes that I'm a student in, is that clear? And you can see that because this is somebody else, right? This little circle is the teacher. And I could create my own class. And if I do, you are gonna enter into some agreements about privacy and so forth, okay? So I'm gonna stop there on, on that account and I'm going to move over to an existing classroom. Let's see if I can do this well. Hmm. Interesting, not that before. Okay, if I come over here, I'm gonna switch here. I have a bunch of different accounts, right? So I'm gonna move over to where I do have a classroom. These are my classes that I run right now. Um, some of them are older, some are newer, some are big classes with 29 students and some are smaller. Um, this is a course that's running right now and it's basically a place where I can uh, communicate with students so that I'm not emailing everybody. And I think that's a huge advantage to having any kind of platform is you don't have to create big group emails and worry about whether they got the email or that kind of thing. Um, so I can write something to this class and everyone will receive it. And when they come in to reply to it, um, they can reply in a thread. So it's all contained in one room, classroom. It's just like having them in there in live, you know, it's a metaphor for that, right? So they can ask a question and then I can continue to answer. Okay. Is so there that's a way to tell that um, 
that they've seen it? Um, no, there are a couple ways for them to, they know when they're in a class, they have to commit to saying, you know, I'll check my email and they'll see notifications there. Uh, and they'll also be encouraged by you to bookmark their class location um, or to otherwise, you know, there is, there is some tech literacy here for, for sure, Robin, to find your classroom. Um, if they have difficulty navigating, they could at least open their email and they'll see notifications, way too many of them, in fact. Uh, if you're in Google Classroom, you know this, way too many notifications, unless you know how to turn them off. But they can click on any one of those and get back to this. Um, notice here that there's a classroom code. Um, so a student could enter that classroom code that we saw in the earlier screen, right? And they could join this class. So that little code is going to help them. If you hit the display, it puts it out there big, they can enter it, um, and then they're in, okay? Um, what else would I mention? So that's the stream. Um, the class, the class, sorry, any questions about this page so far or any additions? Because some of you are much more knowledgeable than I. Well, I wanted to add, Robin, even though they, yeah, they have to check their email to get the notification, but once mm -hmm. they do that, they can, there's an app for their phone, classroom, oh, okay. app to access any of this stuff, phones. Uh, and presuming that their vision is better than ours, they can read, you know, I mean, it depends what it is, but. Some are older than I am, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true, yeah. Good to know. Thanks for adding that, though. It's right. A lot of students are learning with just their phones. Yeah. They don't have a lot of laptops sitting around or other tools. Good. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, okay, so right now you see there's no work due. Um, so you think, oh, well, what's that? So under classwork, this is what I find really useful. Probably the, the reason I use Google Classroom at all is that I can organize classwork, okay? And in this, this is actually a, a real living course. This is a ColorVal Basics Online course, our level one course. And we've just come up through task four. Uh, you can see that I have only live tasks. Uh, I could have scheduled tasks, which I, I could probably model doing. Um, so if we're going to create a task, right now I have four and I need to add a fifth. And I can add an assignment, I could add a quiz assignment, I could ask a question. All of these are assignments that they can complete and turn in. And it's turned in right here and it feels very much like any other kind of a, a platform for learning like Blackboard or, or any other. Which then means I can go over to um, people or grades and see what people have turned in. Okay. Um, so I can say I'm going to make an assignment and from here I have, I keep things extremely simple. I actually do ungraded things. I don't do a lot of grades here. I find it, um, overwhelming and I don't, I don't personally need it. We don't do a lot of grades with what I do. Okay. Um, but you can, you can check it out and try it out in all kinds of ways. The only thing I'd say in general, I've watched my, my kids use Google Classroom, um, it can be pretty intimidating for the student um, because if you miss an assignment and you're late, it's going to label it late. And you just kind of want to use, I like using Google Classroom as minimally as possible to achieve my goal. Um, and then you can explore each of those details with, with thought and make another account, make yourself a student so that you can see what it looks like from the student side. And that's my rationale behind this. Remember, this is me, the student, this little me there, right? So when I'm me, the student, I can go in and see what I feel like when I go here to my classwork. And all of my, my assignments are late because I haven't done my own assignments. Um, but I can view an assignment as a student and, um, and I can see that I have the attachments here. And then as soon as I'm ready to turn in my work, I can mark it as done or I can add or create. Okay. So having two accounts is really useful. Having one that's your private to be a student and one that you use as your sort of educator's Gmail account. Is anybody else doing something similar to that, Liz? Well, I have just realized um, in the last few days, I'm doing the paper airplanes um, training. I don't know if y'all are familiar with that, but it, it doesn't really matter except for that I'm a student in that I didn't create the course, I'm taking the course. And yet it appeared because it's my same email address that I use when I'm creating courses. So it appears like 
you don't necessarily have to have a different account for student and teacher. It appears in the same um, yeah. place as all the other classes that I'm that I'm offering teacher. And if you want later or now, I can show what that looks like. But I also wanted to say that I have been using Google Classroom independent teacher so no one has no one is telling me what I have and can't use but um, I um, have been really loving it since I've gone online because it helps me stay organized and keep like remember what I assigned to who and who was in these classes and you can move things around like you can go back to a class and go Oh yeah, I assigned this thing to those guys, or here was a video that I shared with those guys. I would like to share it with this new class that I'm doing. And it's really easy to move things around. But for me, it's just a great record of like, what did I do again? Who was in that class again? You know, so so for me, it's good that way. But it's all, I can also use it as a student on the same account. Oh, definitely. Yeah, the only advantage of um, having another account is that you can enroll yourself as your own student so that you can experience their, their... Is that like, is that like I'm my own grandpa? Yeah, it's like I'm my own grandpa. I'm my own student. Yeah, so we, have, we have a test student account that we can, you know, so we can add the test student to into our classes. And it makes it super easy to, to get that sense of what, what your class looks like for a student because it does look different to them. Yeah. Precisely. Thank you, Susan. Exactly. <laughs> Great. I was glad to see here in the chats that someone that Susan, you agree that <laughs> a Google Classroom grading uh, gradebook is just not worth the trouble. Oh, our, our teachers were trying to use it with kind of like, you know, weighted categories and it didn't calculate the weights properly and yeah. it, it was just a mess. But they wanted some way for the kids to know how they were doing in the spring, you know, yeah. and it basically... Yeah, I mean, it was helpful for the for kids to know whether they'd done an assignment or not, but to really get a sense of what their grade was, that it was not a good way to do it. Um, and we, we've got meetings coming up. We're going to have to seriously talk through what we're going to do with that. Yeah, it's tricky. Um, it's I would say when you talk about you know ESL students in general and that idea of affective filter, Google Classroom does not do much to keep the affective filter low because it's uh, that combination of if you use grades, that's going to be a, a big hit um, to your ego. Um, but also just the, it's a lot of messaging. It's, it's, not a, it's not the most elegant tool, but that said, it, it is a tool where you can um, organize your own content. And as Jennifer mentioned earlier, um, you know, we wouldn't be dedicating a session to it if it were completely not worth using. It, it's very effective for organizing your content. And I found that that Google, um, do we have a link for it, by the way, Jennifer? The, the Google Classroom uh, Facebook group that we've been hanging out in is pretty useful. Uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't put a link there, but I, I gave it. So you can just, okay. when you go to Facebook, just write that in there and then you'll find the group. They'll ask you a question or two and you just sign up. But yeah, can I say, uh, going back to the, um, uh, when you put your assignments in there, you can create what they call topics. And so you can create like a unit. So if you want to group your assignments and then move them around in it, you create topics and then when you create new ones, new assignments, you can assign them. Um, I can show you re real quick if I share, can I share real quick? You can. Um, and I can show you, um, and this is, uh, I set one up, uh, a Google Classroom for a, um, a tutor, a tutoring session. And so um, don't judge me on my <laughs> categories, but you can see I've created, we were working a lot on consonants and she wanted some things, materials. So there's my consonants and general information. And, what, and uh, these are a bunch of things of, on the topic of meeting new clients, um, these, which is one of her goals. And you can see even once you do that, you can start moving these around. And this is, I really highly recommend it. I think there are more creative ways that you can do it. Um, but I find this to be oh, wait, um, very wait, important. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Um, we found our parents and, and kids really like stuff that was just organized by the week. You know, this is this week's assignments. This is what you need to get done this week. Um, and then making 
you know, subject lines really clear. You know, this is Tuesday's yeah. math. This is Wednesday's math. Yeah. Right. That's what I, and in my school and in the schools and uh, teachers and other, their Google Classroom organization, it's exactly like that. Week one, week two, week three. Yeah. You know, history and, or something specific, colonial history, boom, 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 boom. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's, that's very useful there. Yeah. And, uh, and the grading, I don't even touch to any of that grading, <laughs> but, but assigning a, a, like a quiz individually to each student and they, they have it and all of that, that's really useful in Google yeah. Classroom. And obviously it's, it's different to the high school and college level, but I think we're gonna recommend to our elementary middle school teachers this year that you know, assuming we're still doing Google Classroom stuff at the end of the grading period, that they essentially start a new class for the next grading period. Yeah. So that, you know, you know, September through, you know, November just gets archived. And then that's less overwhelming for, for the families. Yeah, so there, and there's lots of archival, uh, uh, people archiving, is, uh, archiving is very key to Google Classroom, otherwise it gets very messy. <laughs> yeah, archiving and cloning, I think you can set up a, mm -hmm. you know, your standard classroom and then clone it for your most current iteration. So there are tricks and I, again, that Google Classroom um, group in Facebook, that's, I just find it a wealth of information for, for coming up with ideas on those levels. I wanted to answer a question of Megan's. Um, she asked about G Suite and um, I'll say, I have not yet used a G Suite. I have a G Suite that we use for our company, but I run all of my classrooms under a private account, which is color valid chart at Gmail. That's a private, that's just like a person account. So you can do pretty much anything you want um, as an individual with your own Gmail account. Um, if you're talking about a school, then they have G Suite and that allows them to assign um, email addresses to students and users and have volume, you know, kinds of large scale type um, membership within that shell. Karen, do you um, pay for Google Classroom for ColorVal? Because you have multiple classrooms and no, because you don't have them simu running simultaneously so much. Is that? I don't know. It's funny. I, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I've, so just uh, to, so everyone understands, we have a G Suite that we only use for some things, but I've run a lot of Color Val through a private account that's just a Gmail account like yours and mine, and I've not run into any blocks. So, and granted, we only run a couple of courses at a time, so a few courses. When you do your uh, your classes with the free account, do you just use the students' current emails or do they have to get a Gmail to, to use it or, they, or they, what? Yeah, they have to have a Google account, to okay. use, uh, in my understanding. Um, so they do, the, they do need that. And in general, it's a good thing for them to have one. So many tools are reliant on having a Google on account. Google, yeah. yeah. Okay, good. All right. I wanted well, to ask uh, Jennifer how you make those topics that you were showing us. <clears throat> Can't hear you. Oh, Jennifer, you're on mute, girl. Sorry, <laughs> it's been a couple months since I did it. So hold on, let's let us let us go. Oh, well, in that's okay, I can look it up. I thought you I no, I think it you hit um, create and you can create yeah and you can create a topic. Mm -hmm. Look at so that. Let's say, so let me say vowels and add. And there so there's go. vowels. But if I think, you know, if we're working on consonants right now, I'll move that up there. So it allows you, without doing the topics, I don't know that you can sort your, um, your assignments, but once you create topics, then you can. That might be a good solution for, <clears throat> Because I keep looking for a good uh, for not having the paper organizers in the students' hands. And I know that, uh, what's her name? It's some kind of online. It's sort of clunky, but I want to just like pull up a virtual organizer for any given student and add words, you know, with them in the course of a lesson. And I, I haven't quite found a great solution for that, but maybe I could make a topic and have, you know, a different color for each of the assignments and then pull up the assignments as a, I don't know, 
Okay, well, there's a, th this comes to a feature I wanted to be sure to mention, and I think others, again, will be more, please pitch in if you know more than I do. I think one of the, the beauties of Google Classroom, when, you're, when you have all of your documents in a Google folder, is that if you put them in, an, if you just share the folder, for example, let's just pretend I, I share that folder with you. If we, if somebody opens up a document in that and then starts to type into it, it, we'll all see that typing. We'll all see that person's input on that document because it's a shared folder and we're sharing. It assumes that we're collaborating. Whereas Google Classroom, when you take something from a Google folder and put it in as an assignment, there's a little magic that happens. And, and it's actually the thing that I found compelling about Google Classroom is that when they open the assignment, they open their own version automatically. So they don't have to be led through, please, save a copy, which is like a whole, you know, go to the top nav and hit save a copy and save it for yourself in a file where you can find it. I think most of us have trouble doing that, let alone our students. Um, so can anyone elaborate on that? That works consistently. Is that correct? That yeah. you put something yeah. in an assignment, it opens up their own version and they turn it in as yeah. their own. Exactly. That's, that's what I was talking about with the grading and papers and stuff. I have them doing quizzes or writing and they'll have their own copy and uh, sometimes they even forget to click submit and sometimes for the writing you can see what they're writing even though they don't even click submit because you know they forget uh, but it works and uh, but I always tell them you know click submit because it makes a difference but it's very very useful in that way and that you can see what each individual student is writing or doing and um, you can follow along and see what's happening that's that's what I think is the most useful thing about Google Classroom. This is the educator version or some special version? I don't know if it's in the private version, but when you create something, you can create a copy for each student. It automatically opens as a copy for each student. And that's, again, yeah. I'm-, I'm don't There are a couple of things there. There's like one, and if you, if you click the wrong one, you gotta go all the way, you gotta click down and then it'll go down and down at the bottom it's like, make a copy for each student. You have to click on that. Otherwise, uh, students will have one document and they will just be editing it all together, <laughs> which, which I've done. <laughs> and I was like, wait, Mr. Gull messed up. <laughs> Let's do this again. <laughs> so, so here's a quick example in a course, I taught a past course, but um, this, this assignment right here involves a Google Doc and then a PDF that, that serves as sort of a, a model there. And so when the student uh, clicks on this Google Doc, it's, it's an organizer, and they're going to type, it's what color is your life? So they're going to type the words that um, are of their life, uh, whether it's you know, their likes or their uh, favorite books or favorite food or the names of people in their family, everything that kind of are the words of their life. And they categorize them by the color vowel chart and they type them into this Google Doc. Now, are the you a student in this class? Sorry? Could you show us from the student uh, side of it? So as yourself sure. as a student, I'd sure. like to see it. So if open. I'm um, over oh, here so. as me and I go into my other courses here, here I am in this course and here was my classwork. Um, and here's that same assignment come down. Because we know you haven't done any of the assignments. Right, exactly, because I'm a bad student. So, <laughs> oh, but look, I did. I posted a new assignment. Oh uh, No, let's see. I um. What color is your life? So here's my color of our life. It's a missing assignment. I should be able to see that. Interesting. Interesting that over here it only shows up as the PDF. I'm kind of confused actually. But um, I don't know why it doesn't show up quite that way. Let's see. I think sometimes we had issues where if it was past the due date, the assignment <laughs> disappears and the kids can't get to it anymore. So I'm the kid who can't get to it because I'm late. I tell you, for just me personally, Google Google Classroom would be a nightmare for me because I'm I'm always like, can I have like another 24 hours to turn that in? We had discussions about yeah, how how long to extend due dates. Okay. To, to give kids that extra time, but at the same time, you don't want to extend stuff indefinitely. You know, you can't just make everything due at the end of the grading period because then they'll go, oh, I've got nothing due this week. Right. Yeah, there okay, so that's why I mean, it's, it's that. yeah. So it's missing because I didn't turn it in, but it's now also missing and I can't turn it in. Is that what it comes down to? 
Yeah. yeah, I think but, so. But you can control that as the teacher when you first make the assignment. You don't have to make a due date. You can leave it. Right. I mean, now, I know from as Susan's describing, you know, when my kid had all these things that aren't due, now there's no timeline for when to do it. So it's kind of it's kind of a catch twenty two. What you want, what I would like, is a due date with flexibility that they can do it late, because they're already get it. When they turn it in, it's going to say submitted late, and it will. That's a bad enough, you know, big scarlet letter L right there. Late. That is the joke between me and my daughter. It's like you're late. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but in any case, it does work. You know that when they open this document. They simply click on it and it's going into their Google folder and it's, it's named appropriately. And then they turn it in and it has their name as part of it. It's fairly beautiful. It's the equivalent of write your name on your paper. And then they turn it in, you know, it's theirs. And when they type into this, it doesn't show back up on your original in your drive. So that alone was kind of a selling point for me in deciding to start experimenting with Google. Um, classroom. Other questions are coming up. Megan, it's long. You want to read it to us or you want to express your question? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I'm still stuck on this like super basic thing because we had talked about using Google Classroom in my program and then like several people were like, no, no, you have to pay for G Suite for education, which I guess you don't have to pay for, but like, we can't set that up with our, our college is huge. Um, no, I think when you're a college, it really is a different animal. Like when it's an actual institution, they're going to need to arrange it from an institutional standpoint. Yeah. Uh, I have the privilege of being a, a private person with a small business, so I can run it out of both sides to my convenience. Okay. It seems like you can just set it up like if you... I guess that's, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out, is that, is, is that a legal issue or a logistical issue? Like, I think both. I think well, they I wonder have, about that too, given yeah. that my school is small enough that we could do it individually, but I don't know, do we have to get the account with the uh, mystery passwords and things? Well, let me just say, how would, you know, if you were a school, think about the liability if you have a bunch of teachers and a bunch of students, and now you've got teachers setting up classrooms that you can't monitor in any way and now a student comes to you and says this weird stuff happened in this classroom and you know so that's really that's why you would have an institution saying no 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 you're not going to do this on your own and that's a little bit why skip is and other teachers in public school systems are that's the subversive part is like you're trying to you know you're not trying to be a subversive you're just trying to reach people who already are marginalized and falling yeah. through the cracks of communication they always have been yeah, and they when when they when they uh, uh, use the uh, Google Chromebook, they they uh, put a number in there, and that will be their name. All their data, it's all done through the whole county, which is the good thing, because they will never forget their name <laughs> because it's already in there. So their name will be boop on that Google document. Yeah. yeah. I so mean, if you're, security, yeah, go ahead. Security issues for, um, especially for K through 12, it really limits the, the um, tools that you can use. For example, WhatsApp is really popular because it, almost everybody, especially um, English language learners have a WhatsApp account, but you can't use it in K-12 because that it makes everybody's um, telephone numbers visible. To each other yeah. and that you is a huge no-no in yep. public schools so th these kinds of issues are really really important depending on your context yeah yeah and then it, the same goes for any for a school i mean what is a school that that also comes back um liz for example you know you're a teacher and you have a business but is it a school um uh, it's a school maybe with the little s or, or maybe else color vowel is a school with a little s but a school has credits, a curriculum that people have to go through in order to achieve certain kind of graduation or a degree. And when that's involved, you've got to track it. You've got to register. All of that stuff involves confidentiality and security. So that's why, you know, if you're at a nonprofit like Robin, there might be, there might be a way to play both sides for convenience um, because you're not dealing with a high stakes graduation requirement. But K through 12, that's, that's a different ball of wax probably. Well, it is. 
It is. Okay, good. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't always set up your own little classroom just to practice, you know, if you're getting ready to jump into an institutional version. I mean, mm -hmm. at least it's, you know, it's there for you um, to get a glimpse of. Great. Yeah, I, I've used, like, for example of that, I used Loom to video record, like, the instructions for a lesson. And I like that because it sends out, uh, the, like, did someone respond to it or not? And so... I'm like, great, <laughs> someone watched it. <laughs> so th that works, but many things that I've plugged into Montgomery County schools, they're just like, nope, you can't use it. it won't allow you. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Any other Karen, questions or, yeah. Well, I, this is a different topic, but I hope that at some point you will sh uh, show the um not the assignments tab but the the stream is it called stream the, mm -hmm. and and it's basically like facebook it's basically like you can do dialogues or just kind of conversation about stuff and i haven't really used it for this purpose yet but it has occurred recently that it would be a great place to discuss topics you know post a little video or a reading assignment or whatever you can post it right in there assign it to your class, maybe it's even optional, and let them discuss it without having to deal with the chorus of, oh, I don't do Facebook, which always comes up. But, you know, this is completely, you know, isolated. So it, I think it would That's be a good point. Yeah, it's very, it's thready. You know, it's a thread-like setting. So, you know, here's a course I taught um, a while ago, one of the same ones I've shown you. Um, you can sort of get a sense that we didn't do a ton of dialogue, but we did some. Um, sometimes there was a back and forth, but you could definitely leverage that and say, let's do something intentional there. Uh, yeah. Yep. That's what I was thinking. I haven't done it yet, but I was thinking that. Does anyone else have any experience running, you know, really using the stream in a pedagogical way? Um, we, we found that we needed to make sure that um, assignments were not posted to the stream because that became very overwhelming for the kids because assignments show up in the stream in the order in which you post them on the classwork page, which may not then have any kind of organization relative to when things are due or how stuff is organized. Mm -hmm. So having assignments not go in the stream was really helpful. Um, and with the K through 12 kids, um, we actually found it was better to shut off their ability to start conversations in the stream. They could respond, but you know, to something that we had posted, but they were not allowed to, to start a conversation because they did use it as a chat room. And, <laughs> and, and we, we had notifications on so that when stuff was posted there, when people responded to something, you know, we expected it to be relatively important that it was a question about something. Hmm. And so to constantly get, you know, ping, 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 is, you know, kids are sending emojis back and forth was incredibly irritating. I, as, a, as a teacher of adults, I would, that would be music to my ears to have them be just like starting up a conversation about something or whatever, you know. Wow. So long as it's not a string of emojis. Exactly. 11-year-olds, man, watch out. 11 -year -olds. Hey, I have two of those. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but oh. it, can, it, can be, it can be very off-topic, and, and sometimes the language goes in not good places. <laughs> but when, when you have students under a shell of an organization, a school, then they can always go over to um, their, they have their chat feature in Google um, email, I'm pretty sure, if I remember correctly. There used to be. But there's, you know, there's meat in there. And I notice my kids exchange emails with their classmates over an email. So there's that too. It's not quite the same as a, as a Facebook-y kind of multi-person thread. But I, I hear what you're saying, Susan and others, that you kind of want to keep the focus of this carefully cultivated. And it, with children especially, you know, this is really teaching them how to behave in a certain setting. Yeah. Hey, Karen, we've only got about five minutes left. Could you talk a little bit about sharing um, two cups. <laughs> the challenges of being online. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, color val documents and sharing them and, and what's okay to share and in what form? Oh, thank we you. We get a lot of questions about that. There we go. So we're going to shift gears a little bit. And um, if, if I could just get one more raise of hands from folks, could you raise your hand if you are new to ColorVal 
or consider yourself new to ColorVal. Great. All right. So ColorVal, just briefly about what we do. Um, the ColorVal chart is this, it's a visual touchstone for English language teachers and learners that allows us to efficiently identify how spoken English sounds and how to categorize it in a way that's helpful to us. It helps learners know what to listen to and how to hear a word so that it's no longer just a steady stream of speech rushing by, but rather of words that they can actually catch by their color. And a quick example of that for the K through 12 and other newcomers, um, we can just take some really similar words that for us, we take for granted. Um, if you take, you know, South, the word South would be a brown cow word because it has ow in it. And then it changes to an adjective in the same text that the students are reading or the same video they're listening to. And South suddenly sounds really different as an adjective and it becomes Southern. Southern. <laughs> Because and, of the great vowel shift. Yeah. <laughs> and so the English learner can miss that utterance of the word Southern as a word that's related to South because it doesn't sound the same. And in their written knowledge of the word, they're saying Southern. So suddenly there's this word being said and they're missing now whatever percent of the, the cohesion of the text because they didn't know that words change stress and change color, if you will, vowel quality when they change uh, word, word form. So, you know, molecular and molecule, I had students who were missing every time the word molecular was being said, and they just didn't know it was a form of molecule. Um, so what we do with the chart is, is we basically bring to life uh, the spoken word in an organized visual way um, that is apart from the way a word is spelled. It really goes with the sound orientation. So that's like the quick thing of the color vowel um, approach. Does that, anyone want to add to that? Is that pretty kind of okay? <laughs> okay. So, um, and I developed this about 20 years ago with my colleague and, and co-author Shirley Thompson, and, and it has been brought forward by teacher and generations of teachers and students and suddenly became um, kind of enough of a thing that we needed to support it with a small business. So we are a, a small teacher built educational professional development company. Um, and we provide tools and training for teachers. Okay, so then that said, a lot of us are interested in uh, you know, this, this ongoing evolution of what we do with ColorVal and the tools that we um, it turn, it off? Like it's burning. turn it off. <laughs> I don't hear my kid, but I'm actually cooking and I kind of forgot. <laughs> we might be ordering out. <laughs> but in any case, um, we've developed a lot of tools and, and our website has now raised a lot of good questions about just respecting um, the nature of our work and copyright and what we're doing with teachers and, and what we're providing you with. So I'd like to share with you our website, which is here. I'm going to do a little shifting around. Um, but on the homepage of our website, you will find you know, uh, some information about us. But the teachers tab is going to be where all of us in this room today will want to go to just get a grounding and to kind of get the lay of the land of ColorVal. Um, as you come down, you know, if you're new to us, I think this will provide you with some more context. Um, but here are three key materials that I introduce you to and all three are available in our shop. Um, so that's one way to get some of our basic materials is to take a look at these. Um, but these guys are downloadable and usable. And when you download them, you'll find that they're covered by a thing called the Creative Commons license. Um, Creative Commons basically says you are, if you're a teacher, you can share this. Well, Creative Commons says you have permission from the authors to share this so long as it's not for profit and so long as you give it attribution. So it's great, and, and if you've been with me for a long time, you should say, wow, that's a change, because for a while we didn't know how to acknowledge and protect what we do. We, we have copyrights with the State Department, we have copyrights with a textbook series, but you are not businesses. So I want everyone in the room to know, if you're a teacher, you can use our materials and you can distribute the items that are covered by a Creative Commons. Um, now this is not gonna show it to you big, but it'll show you the Creative Commons licensing. Okay, so you can put it up on your Blackboard. You can put it up in Google Classroom. Mm -hmm. um, we have a page. What if we create our own materials based on the ColorVal? Do you, you have a place for that. that or what yep. to do with that? 
you can do that. So we have a page now dedicated to copyright issues. And um, what I love about, I'll just sort of go here to their page. Look at this, it's very simple, I love it. You are free to share, copy and to redistribute material in any medium or format, so long as that item is Creative Commons. You have to look at the, you know, which one it is. The licensor cannot revoke, da da da. Attribution, you give appropriate credit, which is keeping our copyright information and that we made it, that kind of thing. It's non-commercial because you're not going to sell it. And um, if you remix, transform, or build upon the material, you can do that. You just can't distribute it beyond your educational use. So give it to your students, but it's not, you know, going out and um, giving it out, say, I suppose that a presentation would probably be pushing the limit. Um, it might be come back to us because what we'll do with you is we'll say, well, gosh, this is a great, great thing to distribute. Let us distribute it. And we'll put it here in our um, teacher's page under our library and other teachers can get it too. So in our digital uh, that was library. my next question. Yeah. Okay. So here's a digital library. When you come in, all level one teachers can gain access to the library. Um, it's open for the rest of today as kind of a house warming, um, welcoming kind of thing because our website just got launched. So if you're new, go check it out. Tomorrow it closes its doors and is, it is an exclusive resource for level one trained teachers. And that's just kind of uh, part of the way that we build the journey to show that it's, training brings a lot with it. But under digital resources, when you come in, uh, we have a little bit about the Creative Commons again, and then we provide these um, and many more resources ready to go. Um, so just as a quick example, oh, it's not gonna work right now. Let's see. Let's see if I can give you a nice example. It'll open up that way. There you go. So as you can see, it'll be clear at the bottom of a document how it is licensed. And our black and white items, um, everything except for an actual color vowel chart in color is licensed with Creative Commons pretty much. And then that one item is, is the one that we, we maintain is copyrighted um, because it's, it's the center of our work, okay? And we can dedicate another session to really get into fine details, but this kind of, I hope, provides some clarity that you can provide these materials to your students, okay? Um, I, I'm happy to take questions about that. What's here? Lots of neat things here, by the way. I wanna point out too that, um, I mean, I, would, I think we might finish up with a crossword because I think they're so much fun. But Laura McIndoe has recently been creating these color vowel crosswords um, and they're interactive and they're online. So super fun to do. And we'll, we'll come back to Roseboat in just a minute and do one, okay? Um, a lot of our discovery activities are here. Um, everything that we train you to do with respect to spelling exploration, uh, we just keep building here and providing more and more. Um, before long, we're going to have a, some pretty fun ways to do discovery activities online to discover the way um, English sounds. Okay, Robin? Yeah, because I just, um, inspired by Liz Bigler, I just have a whole slew of uh, Jamboard and That's right. uh, Google Drawing stuff that I'm starting, that we're trying to have as a um, folder full of stuff for, for people doing tutoring mm -hmm. at WLC. And I was wondering, do you want that? We do, and you're actually on my list, as is everybody who wants to submit something. So yes, and we're just um, always a little, a couple beats behind <laughs> where we want to be. Um, you know, it's sleep and children and this. You know, so why don't we finish no up hurry. tonight? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because you know the beans are burning apparently, and um, but I would like to finish up by finishing my crossword. I just, you know, I love this tool because when you're in this it'll open up blank for you but if you write into it it keeps your answers in your browser so i'm still not done so here's one down and let's uh give everybody a silent chance to figure it out these are all rose boat o words with cute with little uh hints right can so you the read it aloud sense of to I write mm -hmm. i can't see can you read it aloud sure the simple past tense of to write to write would be, it's a rose boat, 
wrote. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've watched a few learners do this and it's very compelling. Uh, next hint is for two down. When you get dressed, you put on rose boat clothes. People in the thing are saying clothes. Exactly. Thank you. Be my reader, would you? Yeah, I'll be your reader. All Robin, right. you can't, you have to wait 20 seconds before you. Um, you so it's fun. Um, again, for, for our newcomers, uh, recognize what's happening here. For a learner of English, crosswords are no fun because it's just way too much of, I don't know what that word is. My husband balked. He's like, I don't know crosswords. Um, but when he sat with me, I was like, no, do this one with me. And you know, he's a proficient speaker of English. English, he's a Spanish speaker, but he doesn't have the confidence of doing crosswords for fun. But when we know that it's a rose word or a blue word, you already know what you're kind of, you're casting forward like a fishing line for out of your, your mental vocabulary for the word that has that rose stressed sound. So 13 across, when you want to, let me see if I can get this browser up a bit. When you want to call someone, you pick up the and call. You pick up the clove, you pick up the sh show, what? Oh, the phone. All right, eight across. When you say exactly what someone said, you <laughs> smoke them. I don't know, you quote, that's right, quote them. And finally, let's see, what if I make a wrong answer? Where there is fire, there is phone. <laughs> Shoal. <laughs> um, notice that if I do that, it'll show that there's something wrong, right? And it shows here that there's something wrong too. So where there is fire, there is smoke. Okay. And now everything's done. Everything's checked off. We're all happy. And hey, we're set. You can make your own. Um, but that's a nice way to end the day. I want to thank you for coming. This has been a recorded session. We'll post it up on our Friday at 5 YouTube playlist. And uh, thank you so much for being here. If you have questions about Colorville, Jennifer? I was going to say, if you have any unanswered questions from this session, please send them to us and we can um, perhaps incorporate them in another, either Karen's Wednesday at 1, one Wednesday, 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern, <laughs> on Facebook Live, um, or uh, we'll try and answer your questions through email. And my email is custer, somebody type it because okay, I will. Or it keeps adding vowels. Um, customer support at colorval.com. I, I have a question it. for Megan Calvert after you stop recording. <laughs> okay. All right, <laughs> folks. You're, you're welcome to stay or go. Uh, we'll keep answering questions and we'll be back in touch. Have a great day. Happy Friday. Okay. Bye bye. bye. What question could you be asking that can't she be recorded? She's still recording. <laughs>